Welcome to lab 12, the second lab in our series about recursion. Today we're going to be building some additional recursive blocks in order to practice building them and to get experience with some new types of functions. We'll start with the countdown activity. And this block should look familiar. Say the numbers from 3 to 0. This is something that we've previously done using a loop, a repeat loop. And it turns out it's also possible to do it using recursion. The second Im image gives us a basic skeleton for what that block would look like. We've got two different paths that the code could follow depending on the case. The first one is the base case, which in this case executes when x is less than 1, or 0, as the name of the function implies. And otherwise, we've got our regular case, which is down here in the else block, which is yet to be filled out. The general flow for this program is a little bit different than when we use a loop. We're going to keep calling say the numbers from x to 0 with smaller and smaller values until it eventually reaches 0, at which point we'll hit the base case and our, our function calls will terminate. So if we look down here at this second image, we've got the same base case and the regular case is filled in as well. We say the current number, and then we say all the numbers from 1 minus, or the current number minus 1, down to 0. So if we draw this out, what's going to happen is, let's say we start with the number 3. This is going to be our function, and we'll say x starts off being 3. This is going to say the number 3. Uh, Okay, so I'll write that on the side. And output the number 3. And then, shortly after that, it will call itself, but with x minus 1. So in this call, x is going to equal 2. It's therefore going to say 2. And then call itself with an input of x minus 1 which now in this case will be 1. So it calls itself over here. And then one last call gets us to x equals 0. This is going to be our base case. And we're going to therefore execute slightly different code. Which in this case is just say 0. Then we don't call ourselves anymore, the function terminates, and we move on. So what we end up getting is 3, 2, 1, and then 1, 0 to finish us off with the base case. Okay, so this particular type of recursion is referred to as linear recursion because there's only a single call being executed within each block. A single call to to the function, the same function that's calling uh, within each call. To contrast that with the trees we drew last time, if you if you can think back, each we had. Well, let's see. I'm gonna free up some space. We would have the trunk, and then we'd have one call going out to the left, and we'd have one call going out to the right. That's two calls per function. And then from each of those calls, we'd get two calls. And then from each of those calls, we'd get two calls until we had this very elegant looking tree. So this is referred to as tree recursion, not because of the plant, but because you're branching more than once per call. You're calling yourself more than once per call. In linear recursion, you're only calling yourself once per call. So you get one of these waterfall looking patterns that was just drawn up here a minute ago. Most of the activities we're going to be doing today, if not all, are utilizing linear recursion. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next one. Here's the countdown block, similar to the ones we just made, using loops. Note that the blocks on the top run using iteration, meaning the repeat loops. The blocks at the bottom, or at least this first block, is recursive. They're doing the same thing, but they're going about it in two different ways. 
Hopefully this, this top series of blocks is relatively easy by this point to be uh, to think through. The recursive one is probably still a little bit rocky. So if we go on to the next section, you'll see that we've drawn a diagram about what may be a useful way to think about uh, a linear recursive program or a tree recursion, uh, for that matter, executing. So here's the same block we just built. And this is very similar to the diagram I just drew. We'll go through it real quick just to make sure it's still clear. We start off up here with x, which in this case is replaced with a variable called 3, being set to a value of 3. Therefore, we're not going to hit the base case. We're going to take the regular case. We'll say the number 3, and then call ourselves one time. That results in a call to say the numbers from 2 to 0, which says the number 2, and then calls itself with 1 as the input, results in saying a 1, and so on and so on. One important thing to note about how recursion is working that we're not actually utilizing here is demonstrated by these white arrows. After a function call completes, control is going to be returned to the function that called it last. This is something that's been happening all along. It's a, it can be a little bit more confusing to think about it in a recursive context, but it's not a new idea. It's something that you've actually been using uh, for the past couple weeks. Once a, any function finishes, it returns control back to whatever called it. So in this case, we've got four copies of the same function. When this last one finishes, it just returns control back to the third version, which returns control back to the second version, which returns control back to the first version. And note that it, it terminates itself immediately after it hears back from its, from its child call, because in this case, there's nothing to do after the child call completes. We'll see some examples of where we use this, this little property of rolling back up uh, in one of, the later, one of the later labs. Or just kidding, perhaps we'll see it right here. So here we've got something very close to the same code we were just looking at. The two blocks down here in the regular case are actually swapped, though. If I flip back for just a second, you'll see that over here we were saying the value and then calling ourselves. Here we're actually going to call ourselves and then say the value. So it's a very similar flow. We've got a very similar diagram here but the output is actually going to be a bit different. I'm going to jump back again one more time. So here, the output we'd see would be 3, 2, 1, 0, because we're saying before we call a new version of ourselves. It's the opposite happening here. The first thing we do in a, in a regular case is to call ourselves and go down to the next version. We keep doing that, keep doing that, until we hit the base case. Here that occurs when x equals 0, so we end up saying 0 before we say anything else, then return control back to the function that called us. In this case, this is a little bit different than the last one, and this is the key difference to note. When control returns back to this block, there's something up left to execute, and that is the say. So we get the zero from here, return control back to the block above it. This says one, return control back to the block above it, now that there's nothing left to do. This says two, we return control back above it, and this says three. So we were moving in decreasing order in the previous function, starting with three, then two, then one, then zero. In this case, we're actually starting at 0 and working our way back up to 3. OK, so here we've got a quiz. It's just one quick question. In the image of, say, the number from 0 to x, we want to know in which block the base case is executed select which block below. So this diagram should look very familiar.
So we want to know where the base case is executed. The base case is the same in all these. It occurs when whatever number is passed in is less than 1. So we keep going down, keep going down, and this is where the base case is actually executed because 0 is less than 1. So that means that we can answer D, the block where x equals 0. It may not be D for you, but that is the answer that we're looking for in this case. Submit that, and there we are. Okay, maximum score, that's good news. We've got one more quiz here with one more question. Okay, so this problem deals with a new recursive function. We have shown you diagrams for similar functions. In reality, we wouldn't use such a time-consuming diagram to trace through code. We've got a truncated diagram. Okay, so if the argument 3 is provided for x, we should type the output that occurs with spaces in between each number that is said. Okay, so let's get the drawing board up for this. And let's walk our way through it. got a diagram here on the screen, but sometimes it helps me to think if I just write my own. So we'll start with mystery of 3. Oops. I'm, I'm just going to call it m equals 3. And what is m going to do? So it's not going to hit the base case. Instead, it is going to say the number 3, call itself with x minus 1. So here at the bottom, we have said 3 so far. Here m equals 2. We're going to say 2 and call ourselves m equals 1. We'll say 1. And then finally, we'll hit our base case, which is, excuse me, n equals 0. Okay, so the base case is slightly different here. All it's going to do is say the number 0, which adds on one more thing here. And then, as you may recall, we're going to start returning control back to whatever function called us. So back here in this block, where m equals 1, control returns from the mystery block, and we execute the next instruction, which is say x or in this case m, m equals 1, so we're going to be saying 1, returning control back up to where m equals 2, we're saying 2, then returning control back up to where m equals 3, and we'll say 3, and then control hops on out of this recursive area here. So the output we end up getting is 3, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, and the instructions indicated that we should type that here, 3, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. So this is pretty much a combination of the two different blocks we just saw. We're saying before we call ourselves, and we're also saying after we call ourselves. So what we get is both numbers decreasing, and then once we get all the way to the bottom, the number's increasing once again. And that is correct. Okay, maximum score yet again. Okay. So we want to work with a partner to write the following function using recursion. It should say the numbers between x and y, or min and max. Okay, cool. So here we've got BYOB. I've loaded up tool sprite, just in case we need it. I'm going to start off just making a block. Say the numbers, oops. 
say the numbers between min and max. Okay. Let's see if we get any hints here. Not at all. But we do want to say the number x, min, and the number y, max. Okay, that's important to know. Since this is going to be a recursive block, we're going to want an if-else. And we're going to want to stop at some point. It requires, any every recursive block requires some form of base case. In this case, what our our goal is, is to start at minimum and work our way towards maximum. So perhaps a logical stopping point would be once we've reached maximum. So in order to do that, that's a fairly um, useful base case for us. So if the current number is equal to the maximum, let's come back to that, then just say the maximum. Otherwise, we'll say whatever the current number is, blink for now, and then call ourselves. I'm going to make both of these numbers just to be clean. Okay? We say the numbers between what and what. So again, we're starting at min. If min equals 5 and max equals 8, we're going to want to say 5, 6, 7, 8. So one, there's two different ways we could do this. First of all, we could, we could create a local script variable to represent the current number we're on. Or what we can do is just keep max the same. That's not going to change. Since we're starting at the bottom and working our way up, we could just use this value min to represent whatever the current number is. Like that. And then fill min in everywhere that we were talking about current numbers. So let's talk about each of those again one more time. So the, the flow is that min is going to be a number that changes with each call. It's like the x in the functions we were writing before. So as soon as min equals max, that means we're done. In a regular case though, if min is 5 and max is 8, then we'll start off by saying 5, and then we'll say the numbers between 6 and 8. That call will go through and say the numbers between 7 and 8, and then that call will go through and get to this condition here, and min will be 8 in that case, max will also be 8. So in that case, we're actually going to terminate. We'll say the number 8, and then we'll finish up. Let's try that out. 5 and 8. 5, 6, 7, 8 and it stops. Great, okay. So that worked. Note that one thing this is not doing is checking to make sure that min starts off lower than maximum. This is something that you could build in checks for. All it would take was would be a little bit of extra conditional work. You could have one extra if, or possibly even combine it in what you've got already by just saying greater than or equal to and that'll also work. Now it's, it's not defined in the problem what should happen there but in this case at least it won't run forever. Before that change was made if min was 10 and max was 5 you just continue to increase min until it equaled 5, which of course would never happen, and your program would run forever. In this case, though, your program will simply say the number 10, which is the first number, and then it's going to stop. Probably a relatively sane way to handle those inputs, which don't make sense to start off with. Okay.
So that's our block. Let's test it one more time since we made a change, just to make sure it still works. We got five, six, seven, and eight. Great. And the flow here is very similar to the ones we were illustrating earlier. All right. So we've got another quiz. All right, now it's actually going to call us out on some of the potential errors that, that could happen here. Does your program work, work with each of the inputs below? Just consider each case and select the ones that you caught originally. And you can grade this for your own work, not necessarily what we just went over, if you happen to do it before uh, this walkthrough. So once you've finished the self-test, go back and revise your function to make it work for all of these inputs. So with min equals zero and max equals zero, it says the number zero a single time. Let's test it. And I'm gonna hide this tool sprite, which is really killing the vibe. Hide, okay. We get zero one time. Okay, success. With min equals zero, 0 and max equals 3, it says the number 0 through 3, including 0 and 3. That's just like the case we've been testing, but let's make sure. 0, 1, 2, 3 is what we're hoping for here. Great. Okay. And then when min is bigger than max, which is what we want to fix at the very end of this uh, block construction process, no numbers are said. That's slightly different behavior than what we said, uh, but is relatively easy to change. So if min is larger than max, then nothing should be said. One way to do that is just to include an additional if up top and just move this condition that we put there into a section of its own. This is in essence a second base case and one that's just going to terminate the block. A nicer way to organize this would be to say if not this then do this which is equivalent to what we had before. Beforehand if min was greater than max, we'd do nothing but terminate the script. And I guess really that should have been an if else in this case. Like this. There we go. Sorry about that. So if min's greater than max, say nothing, as this prompt told us. Otherwise, if it's the same, you know continue to behave like we would expect. Since this is blank up here, we can actually compress this whole thing down to just a single if. We don't really need any code to execute here, so th there's no reason to have an if else. If we just do if not this, we'll execute the code that would have been down here. And we can get rid of our if else, get rid of our or, and toss this puppy in. Let's test that to make sure. Five and one. Okay, and nothing's happening. Let's just make sure with five and six that the appropriate inputs still work. Five, six, and then five, five should say the number five one time. Great. Okay. So we just added in one extra conditional check in order to get the block to perform in the way that it's now spec'd out for. Note that there's no real obvious correct way to do this at this point, uh, but the specification just chooses a, a particular way. Okay, I guess I should leave that unchecked since I didn't catch it originally. And now I've got it working. Let's just go ahead and submit it. Doesn't really matter. finish the review.
Okay? So now we'll make another linear recursion block, which is going to be a recursive squiral. We've done the squiral before, and we've done it using a repeat loop. Here's the code for it. Now we're going to try and do a recursive version of that same block. Let's pull up BYOB. Just go ahead and toss this to the side and shrink Alonzo down a little bit. Okay. So the inputs that are recommended is a single value, x, and then we have an internal variable called length. So we're going to make a block here. of an x was what? Levels. Okay. Let's give this a name. X. Okay, so if you remember with the squiral, what we were doing, drawing board, there we go. What we were doing was starting outside and working our way in like this. The way we would determine the length of each line, as you can see here, is based on the value of x. So we have length. Here it's a, it's a constant value of 10. And we start off moving length times x steps, which if x starts off at 5, means we're going to move 50 steps at first. Then turn 90 degrees, change x by negative 1, so decrease x, and then move 40 steps the next time. Then 30 steps then 20 steps, then 10 steps, and then 0 steps. So that's what we're going to do in the recursive version as well. We're just going to structure it a little bit differently. So as you have hopefully picked up on, every recursive block has a base case. We'll say, in this case, that x when x is oops, less than 1, we'll do nothing. And we'll, we'll restructure this in a minute if it's, if it's not exactly what it should be. So the base case is just a stop. That's our stopping point. For our regular case, we're going to move. some amount of steps, rotate some amount, and then call ourselves to do some more drawing. Let's go ahead and make x a number. Okay. So we'll move, turn, and draw ourselves. I'm going to pull the image up again just to make sure this makes sense. Move some amount, turn right, and then call ourselves to draw another line turn and draw again turn draw again turn draw again okay so this is our basic framework now we just need some values let's stick with our script variable called levels oops or excuse me called length we'll just set length to 10 here this could also be a parameter, which might make a lot of sense, but we'll just stick to what the example says. And we'll move using the same formula that the iterative block did. Note that none of the real computation has to change. More of the structure of the program changes. There's no loop here. There is a conditional. We are calling ourselves uh, and that's 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 the real change between these two different methods of of structuring your programs. So we'll move a certain amount. We'll turn 90 degrees, 
just like we did before, and then draw a spiral with one fewer level. X minus one levels. Okay. What you'll notice is that the same thing is happening that was happening in the last example, which is we've got a base case with nothing in it. So as you may recall, when that is the case, we can just grab an if, do the opposite of this, and then move this up. The opposite of less than one, when you're dealing only with integers, is greater than zero. Okay, because the number zero or less was required in order to make the last one true. In this case, one or greater is needed. Two mutually exclusive groups of integers. So I'm going to throw this away. And there we go. So take a look at the image along with the code and see if this makes sense. Note that there's some similarities between this and the code we've got here. In the iterative version, we're moving a certain amount, turning 90 degrees, and then decreasing this value of levels by negative 1, or decreasing it by 1. It's exactly the same thing we're doing here, we've just structured it differently. So now let's give it a shot. Oh, and let's actually put the pin down. Maybe clear right beforehand. Nice. There we go. We got a spiral. All right. The last activity in this lab asks us to determine the sum of a series of digits in a particular number. We've got an iterative version here. So if we read through this, we've got two variables, two script variables, one called sum, one called index. Sum starts off at zero, index starts off at one. And then we move through each letter of num, which is going to be a digit. And in each case, we increase the sum by whatever the current letter is, and then change index by one. So let's just start off with 345. Index will start off at 1, which means that we're going to change sum, which starts off at 0, by z change it to 0 plus 3. This could also be done with the change block and you just get rid of this first part. So sum then becomes the number 3. The next time through the loop we get the 4, add that on here. The next time through the loop you get the 5 and you add that on here as well. The sum ends up being 12. Okay, now we want to write a recursive version of the same function. Just going to clear away our squiral work and create a new block. Recursive sum of digits in some number. Okay, so the base case here may be a little less obvious. What we again want to think about is when we're going to be done with the computation or at least it'll be trivially easy to finish the computation. In this case, one place it would be triv trivially easy would be if num only had a single digit in it. Then the sum of all those digits would be whatever that one digit is. If the number is 5, for example, the sum of all the digits in the number 5 is 5. 
And we can check that by using the length of block, finding the length of the number, and checking to see if it is less than 2. Actually, there should really be two different cases here. It's possible that num could have zero digits in it as well. So let's actually make a double base case. The first case, the less interesting one, will be that if the number of digits is less than one. Well, that doesn't make any sense. The number of digits is zero. We're simply going to report zero. Duplicate this block. If the length is one, we're going to report num, like in the case of five. And then we've got the interesting one. In the regular case, we want to report the sum of all the digits in whatever the current number is, which is just going to be, if we go back to the diagram, in the case of 345, one really nice way to break this up would be to find the sum of just 3 plus whatever the rest of everything else is. And then the next call could figure out the sum of 4 plus whatever everything else is. This would then be the base case, which gives us 5, returns 5 back to the call before, which adds its 4 in, which returns control back to the 3, which adds its 3 in. It's a little bit convoluted to think about in some cases. In fact, let's go ahead and draw it in the same waterfall diagram that we had earlier. Num equals 3.45. What I'm proposing here is that we keep the first digit in this call and just pass down num equals 45. Then we pass down num equals 5. And this is going to be our base case because it's got a single digit and it's trivial to compute the sum of the digits if there is only one digit. So the sum in this case is 5. This block is now going to add whatever its digit was to whatever the value returning from its call below it is. So it's going to do 5 plus 4 and return that. And then this block will do exactly the same thing except it's going to be adding 3. So it'll have 9 plus 3 return back, 9 just being the sum of 5 and 4. In order to do that then, we're going to need a little help from the tool sprite. We've got report the first digit, letter 1 of whatever the num is, plus recursive sum of digits in everything included in num except for the first digit. Remember back in the diagram that we want to pass down to our next call the entire number except for the first digit, which this block is essentially going to take responsibility for. So here we want to clip off the first digit and send everything else along. In tool sprite, we conveniently enough get all but first letter of num, drop that puppy in, and we've got it. Let's test this now. I'm going to go ahead and make this a uh, number argument. Okay, recursive sum of digits in 3, 4, 5. 12. Very good sign. Let's try one more. 5, 6, 4, 2. Should be 6, 12, 17. Nice. 
All right, looks like we got it. And then let's make sure to test our base cases. So the value 8 should give us 8. Then even if we want to go crazy and just leave it blank, we still get a 0. OK, so let's run back through that again. Our first base case just checks to see if the length, this is more of a sanity check than anything. If the length of num is 0, then the user in inserted a blank character, which means nothing to us. And so we just report 0. The more practical base case that we're actually going to hit every time is when the length of num equals 1. This is what terminates a correctly functioning case because the sum of a single digit number is easy to compute. The regular case occurs right below that and takes the first character off. This function accepts responsibility for whatever that character is and then passes the rest to another call of itself below, which does the same thing and same thing and same thing until you reach the base case. So this function is going to execute once for every digit in the number, including the base case. All right. Note, by the way, that this isn't really a recommended way to handle numbers in a program. Here, we're not treating this string of characters as a number. We're treating it more of a more of uh, as a word, looking at each letter of it one at a time, and then treating each individual letter as a number. This isn't really a good practice, but in this case it's okay. Um, and the lab actually talks about this a little bit. Um, and in fact, a proper iterative solution is also shown here. Not a recursive solution, but we'll leave that as a activity for you. Okay, and that actually wraps up this lab. We've got one more recursion lab coming up next, which is going to show some real world applications, relatively real world applications, certainly some more interesting applications of how recursion can be a very, very useful tool. Thanks, and see you next time.